Uh, good morning, everyone. So this talk will be about machine learning with F-sharp. I want to make immediately a clarification is that the, uh, there was a with F-sharp comma Redux. Uh, so this talk is not about Redux. I do not do any JavaScript. I do not do any web stuff. Like part of it was me revisiting old ideas I had about machine learning and see if they still held. So if you're looking for anything related to JavaScript or web stuff, this is probably not the place you want to be at right now. Uh, so I realized a bit late that this was a potential ambiguity. So, so this is, on the other hand, about machine learning and f -sharp. So if you are there for this, hopefully you will get what you want. So uh, briefly, uh, so I said already good morning. So my name is uh, Matthias Brandevinder. You can find me on Twitter as uh, this little creature here. This is also how I look on GitHub. Uh, and my two, so I'm not a software engineer by training, like my background is really in applied math, uh, economics, like uh, that type of stuff. And at some point, uh, I moved from uh, France to California, people who moved to California started to write code, so I started writing code. I became a developer and uh, I fell in love. Uh, first, I started working with C Sharp and like a couple of years back, somebody told me every year you should learn a new language. It was 2010. I looked at F Sharp, I completely fell in love with the language, and so at that point, most of what I do is either F Sharp or machine learning, typically both of them at the same time, hence the talk. Uh, so where is this talk coming from? So the, uh, I'm going to start with the two statements which are probably not uh, polemical. Like one of them is like machine learning is a pretty hot topic. Uh, it has been hot for a couple of years and it's getting only hotter. So it's a topic you should probably care about as a software engineer. And now, like, if you come from uh, mostly a .NET background like I do, is like you might be a bit concerned too, because if you look at machine learning talks or machine learning discussions, you will hear a lot about Python, a lot about R, a lot about uh, maybe Scala, many languages, and what you will not hear typically is .NET. And so you might be concerned and say, like, uh, does this mean that uh, if I'm a developer coming from .NET and I want to do machine learning, should I move away and start to embrace Python and R? And uh, the short uh, answer for me is that you should probably learn Python anyways because you, you should learn a new language every year. But otherwise, uh, I have been doing machine learning with F -sharp on .NET for like four years uh, straight and it has been working great for me. So I'm hoping uh, to convince you today that uh, uh, not all things are desperate and if you want to do machine learning on .NET, there is a great solution right there for you for the picking, which is called F -sharp. That's kind of the uh, gist for why I wanted to do this talk. So I really have two goals here. One of them is uh, I see that uh, for a lot of developers, when you come into the field of machine learning, it looks pretty magical. It's like people do numbers and things happen. Like you saw the, uh, the keynote earlier, like uh, you, uh, you get flying cubes, all this stuff. And it's like it, uh, it looks a bit like magic and it's not quite clear what is happening. And so my goal here will be to give you a demystification of machine learning, try to give you a sense for what is it that machine learning people are doing, how is it close to what you do as a developer, and maybe get a sense for, in real world, uh, what is it that machine learning people do. And on the other side is like, if there are machine learning practitioners in the room who are not familiar with F-Sharp, I'm going to try to show you why you might want to consider also using F-Sharp as a tool in that space. So this is uh, what I'm uh, aiming to do. What I'm not aiming to do is a deep dive into machine learning or into F-sharp. That would be too much for one hour. It would be too much period. So I will not try to do that. Uh, in that frame, my plan is going to be uh, roughly like two big parts. One of them is like a demystification of machine learning. So I'm going to try to show you like uh, if you are a machine learning person, what is it that you do? And so I'm going to go through it and like try to show you like uh, very practically if I had a machine learning problem, how would I approach it? What tools would I use? And uh, what does this mean? Uh, so in that frame, we will looking first at, uh, for machine learning, you need data. So we'll show you a bit like what you can do with data, what data looks like. Uh, then what does this mean to create a model? And then one thing which is, I think, very important compared to software engineering uh, traditionally, which is like validation, like how is it that you know that your model is working? So this is like uh, the first part will be like, what is machine learning doing? And the second part will be focused a bit more on specifically F-sharp and functional programming, and that will be about uh, why uh, some specific reasons why I think it's great. One of them would be uh, using a statically typed language like F-sharp is actually pretty interesting. Uh, I'll try to show you why I think so. And the other one is uh, if you use a functional programming language, it's also pretty convenient for all sorts of things like parallelization and scaling algorithms. So I'm also going to uh, talk a bit about that. So in that frame, let's start with uh, the first part, which will be uh, what do machine learning people do? 
So to do this, I'm not going to do, uh, my focus here will not uh, going to be uh, spectacular demos. I will take just a data set which happens to be a classic. It's the Titanic data set. Uh, so I'm assuming everybody is familiar with the Titanic, like it was a great boat and uh, uh, as uh, the, so I found this on history.com and like the caption for the picture was, at the time of uh, the completion, many claimed that the Titanic was indestructible. I'm assuming that you are aware of the fact that it was not indeed indestructible. And uh, just for this, like this would already be like my first advice in machine learning is like uh, always take with a grain of salt any form of prediction somebody or some model will give you. Like it might be true, but like uh, it's not because I tell you that it will happen that it is correct. So uh, always be uh, cautious. Now the reason I want to talk about the Titanic, so this is a, a classic data set and uh, uh, um, which, so this is why I'm going to be using it because Titanic has been extremely well documented. You even have a website called the Encyclopedia Titanica where you will find many things, uh, among others, you will find like, a full list of the passengers on the boat with uh, a boatload of information about them. Things like uh, you had like 13,000 passengers and for them you will know whether that person survived or not, uh, how that person was called, how old they were, how much they paid, whether they were first class, second class or third class. So this is like a nice data set. Uh, it's, uh, it's one I like too because you have a bit of everything. You have numbers, you have text, you have missing data. Like you will pretty much hit every problem you could have with the data set using uh, the Titanic data. So I like this one. Uh, it's also, I don't know, maybe there is a bit of a morbid sense of uh, humor around uh, machine learning people, but for some reason it's also kind of fun to try to predict like, who dies and who doesn't. If you feel uncomfortable with that idea, uh, imagine that instead of looking at uh, people dying or surviving the Titanic, uh, you're really looking at people who clicked uh, on a button on your website and you try to predict not if they die, but if they clicked on a button to buy your product. That's pretty much what you would get also in a, in a more neutral, less uh, gloomy data set. So, so we have a data set and the first step you would do is like uh, there is really no machine learning without data. So the first thing you would want to do is like uh, let's dive in the data and see what we have there uh, before even trying to do any form of uh, modeling or machine learning. And so to do that, I will actually be using a tool which is called uh, IPython Notebooks. So I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, the, uh, this is something which is, uh, as the name suggests, which is coming from the Python community. So the uh, Python Notebooks came from the idea that if I'm doing a bit of research work on data on my machine, I might want to be able to share it with you. I might uh, want to uh, work with other colleagues and uh, they might want to see how I got my results and all these things. So the idea is something like a development environment where I can work freely uh, in a, something like a scripting environment, but I can share it with others and, uh, and uh, get comments or like, uh, yeah, share it. So uh, that started with Python and then people actually uh, uh, realized that maybe if it worked with Python, it would be a good idea for other languages as well. And so it supports kernels, which support a variety of languages like R, like all these things. And uh, among others, like there is an f -sharp kernel, which is what I'm going to be using now and I'm going to show you how it looks. Uh, so the way you would run an IPython notebook, you have really a, a bunch of ways to do that. One of them would be you could run it on a Docker instance, like it could run on your machine. I'm running it now locally completely on my machine. As it happens, is like it exists also on Azure now uh, under the name Azure Notebooks, so it's still in preview. But uh, if you want to play with it, like it's a, it's a pretty nice tool. I would recommend to take a look, like regardless of whether you do data science or not. Like very interesting if you want to, uh, if you do any form of data exploration and you want to share findings with colleagues, it's awesome. So let me show you how it looks. So here what I did is like I created a notebook for the Titanic. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking at the data using that tool and showing you maybe like what is in the data and uh, what we could potentially do with it to make predictions, which is uh, what we are after. So before doing this, I will start with, uh, uh, I'm assuming, uh, of course, I would like to assume that everybody in the room knows f -sharp and does it uh, day in, day out. It might not be the case. So I'm going to try to tell you like the, a couple of things you might want to know about the kernel, uh, about f -sharp and about notebooks, and then I will dive into the data itself. So if you have not seen f -sharp before, f -sharp is a functional first, statically typed .NET language. So what this means here is like, so here I'm in my notebook and I can start to write code. And that code will be uh, statically typed and all of this. So I'm getting things like uh, system.io. So I'm getting like IntelliSense and all of these things. This is pretty nice. I'm getting a, an online scripting environment with uh, all the things I would expect from a full IDE. Uh, the point here is like I'm writing f -sharp. I'm, uh, I'm I can use system. I can use all the libraries from .NET. So f -sharp is fully compatible with .NET. Uh, so uh, as a result, I could do things like ask what day is today. So here I wrote a bit of code and I can run it. 
And if I look at uh, what's today as a day of the week, I can take that bit and I can run it, and I'm going to see that today is apparently Wednesday, which I believe is correct. So uh, the, the point here being like I'm running code live uh, and seeing like what the results are. And if I share that notebook with you, you will be able to run my code and check if yes or no. Uh, like uh, um, it's great if you trust me, but as a data scientist, you should not trust people. So now you can take my code, run it, and check if yes or no, you agree with my results. So uh, I can use .NET. Otherwise, like in a way similar to Python, uh, F sharp is a uh, uses significant white space. What this means, like no curly braces, none of this thing. So if I write a function, is like every time you have space, it means like uh, you have it's uh, the scope is delimited by the the spacing. Third thing is a uh, like PowerShell or like Unix. F sharp has this uh, uh, feature called the pipe or a pipe forward. And what this, uh, the idea behind the pipe forward is like it would be nice if I could compose operations. And so the pipe does exactly this. Here I have like add x and y. And what I can do now is I can say take one, pipe it to add one. So it will take it, push it to the next function, pipe it to add two, which will push it and so on and so forth. So this gives give me a mechanism for I can take something, push it to a function, push it to a function, push it to a function, which gives me a workflow of operations happening. So this is, I think, the uh, all you need to know, or most of uh, what you need to know about F-sharp to be able to follow this talk. The other thing I want to, to show before diving in uh, our data is uh, if you're coming from a C-sharp background, is like uh, you're probably uh, familiar with Link. And uh, so a lot of uh, the operations you will do on uh, F-sharp or manipulation of collections or data sets look a lot like Link with slightly different names. And the two operations you, you probably want to know about is like map and filter. So map is the equivalent to select. Take a collection, apply something, transform it, and give me another collection which has been transformed. And filter is the equivalent of where. Like, uh, take a collection, and whenever it's true, keep it, and whenever it's false, drop it. So this would give me something like this. I can say here, I have a list of one to 10, and I can say, take this, pipe it to a filter, so that I will say, like, out of all the x's here, keep only the ones greater than four, and then map it so that I take all the x's, multiply by two. So what I should get here, if I run this, is something like, uh, so I should have a number only about uh, 5, 6, 7, uh, 9, and 10. Multiplied by 2, I should see 10, 12, blah, blah, blah. This is what is happening, and this is what we'll be uh, using th throughout the talk. So, so that was the uh, introduction on the F-Shop side. One thing which is nice about notebooks is like, uh, uh, notebooks is really a full-fledged uh, .NET development environment. So I got IntelliSense, I got all this stuff. What I got as well is like, it would be a bit sad if I could not use NuGet packages, right? It's like, I don't want to write everything from scratch. Uh, you have plenty of libraries. And uh, as it turns out, it's like, you can use them by uh, using Packet. So Packet is like a NuGet client, and I can do things like use Packet, and I want to use uh, the NuGet package of sharp data and exploit Plotly, I can do that, and now I can use it in my script. So at that point, I'm pretty happy, because what this really means is like I pretty much have everything I would have in Visual Studio, but I will be able to share my script with you. Now let's get into the data set we want to explore. So I mentioned the Titanic data set, so let me first show you how this looks. So now I'm going to uh, go for a second uh, in, uh, in uh, VS Code. And so this is a CSV file, uh, because, like, uh, because it's always a CSV file in the end. And so the CSV file contains a bunch of uh, data. So I have 13, uh, 1,300 passengers. And for each of them, I have some uh, information. I know the class of the passenger. Was it like a first class, second class, or third class? I know whether the person survived or didn't survive. Like that's denoted as a one or zero. How they were called, whether they were male or female, how old, uh, whether they had like a family on board, essentially. Uh, how much they paid for the ticket, like uh, all sorts of information. So this is what I want to use, and I'm going to be using the data set to try to make various types of predictions using machine learning techniques. So now is like what I really want is like I have this file, I want to get it in memory so that I can actually work with it. And so we'll do this in, uh, the, uh, in my notebook. So let me go back to the uh, Python notebook here. And uh, the uh, one mechanism which is pretty awesome about f -sharp is you have this thing called type providers. And so a type provider, you can think of it as a mechanism where you can point it to a certain type of data. It will look at it, and it will immediately do what you would have to do painfully by hand. If I had to parse a CSV file, I would look at it, see I have headers, I have things which are numbers, booleans, and all of this. I would create a class with all these fields. I would read it, and I would have wasted half a day to do that. With the type provider, what I can do is I can say, hey, here uh, you have a file which is called called titanic.csv, so that's the location in my file here. I create a type called titanic based on it. And so, and if I run this now, is like I can start consuming my, uh, my data set and working with it. So for instance, I can read it in memory and I can ask like how many items do I have? 
Oh, and I should have run this before. Yeah, this was, I mean, oh, okay, I will not run it here, like, that's fine. The, uh, but the, uh, what, uh, I should have run like uh, the beginning of the, uh, uh, the script before, so I will not do that here. But what this will get me is like, essentially it will create for me on the fly classes, which allow me now to access the data uh, in a statically typed manner. For instance, I could grab the first passenger from my sample, and I could start to do things like first passenger dot, and what this will tell me is like based on the file you just gave me, I had nothing to do. I will give you like properties which you can start consuming. For instance, I can say I have uh, the class of the passenger, which is an integer. Did the person survive? As it happens, it's like it was smart enough to see that I had zero and ones. If I have only the zero and ones, in all likelihood, this is a Boolean. So it was smart enough to say like this is probably a bull. Similarly, I have an age, which is a float and all these things. So the, the gist of the story here is like uh, with the type provider is like all the painful work you have to get data to your environment is kind of done for you. And now all I have to do is like I can work with the data set and start to see do I have anything interesting here. So let's look a bit at uh, what we could ask. So this is where pipes and, uh, and the maps and all of this is going to come in handy. I could, for instance, ask things like uh, how many uh, male and female were in the Titanic. And so I would write something as simple as this, like take the sample. And now it's like I want to count by. Uh, the sex. And so if I do this and I run this, it's like nicely I will have something which will tell me I had like uh, 486 females on the Titanic and 843 male on the Titanic. So I can start exploring very uh, freely my data set. One way you could think about notebooks perhaps is like it's something similar to LinkPad, like where you get all these nice tools which allow you to see what uh, is happening in your data, except that you will be able also to persist it and save it and give it to a colleague to look at. So I have males, I have females. I can see how many people survived and died. So this is all good, and this is great. And uh, I, can, uh, I could ask us a question of like, uh, look at how much people paid uh, for the ticket and count it by the price they paid. And so if you do this, like, you will get two things uh, which might be interesting to note. Like the first one is like the first thing which will come off is like NAN. And so NAN is like not a number. And so the uh, lesson here, or like uh, my experience with uh, machine learning and data science, is uh, your biggest problem will be like any data set you have will be worse than what you expect it to be. You will have missing data, you will have, it will be a mess, and you will waste a lot of time on the, it will never be as clean as you hope. So that's the first part. And the second part is like what I did here was accounted by the price uh, people paid for the ticket, and this is pretty useless. Now I can see like uh, uh, how many, like I have very uh, close prices, uh, so the, uh, the point here is like the operation I would want to do on uh, how much you paid for the ticket is not a count. It makes sense to ask like how many male and how many female were on the uh, boat. Uh, in the case of uh, how much you paid, like the question is a bit different because this is really a number. And if I have a number here, I would ask things like what is the average, what is the maximum, uh, 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 what if the price increased by 20%. And so the broad point here is like even though uh, everything will be encoded as numbers in a data set, you have two broadly, uh, two widely different shapes for the data. One of them is you have numbers, like how much you paid, how old you were. Questions like uh, where it makes sense to compare people, uh, increase a number, decrease a number, and you have data which is called categorical, and categorical you're really after, is this thing an A or a B? Was the person a man or a, 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 man or a woman? Was uh, the person first class, second class, or third class? And the question like, uh, were you like 20% more man then that passenger doesn't really make sense. So this is important because based on the shape of the data, you will use the data in a very different way and you will ask very different questions about it. So, uh, so that was the first point here is that we have very different shapes of data in a data set and so that's something we want to keep in mind when we're going to try to make predictions or use the data to, uh, to do whatever we want to do with it. So I mentioned the fact that uh, the notebooks give you the ability to run F-sharp code and like start to analyze data. Looking at numbers is nice, but like sometimes it's also pleasant to look at charts. Like a chart can tell you a very good story in a, in a way which is much more, uh, say, human friendly than just a series of numbers. So wouldn't it be nice if we could actually see charts? As it happens, like you have this in notebooks. Whoops. And so here I'm going to use a library called Plotly, which is like a NuGet package again. So I load it and now I can do things like uh, before what we did was the count by sex. So what I had was like how many passengers were male or female. And I can simply say pipe it to chart.column. So give me a chart for this. And sure enough, what I will get is like in line in my notebook, I will be able to immediately see this is how it looks in graphical form. So this is pretty convenient. Similarly, I can do things like uh, I can ask 
uh, you have an information on where the passenger embarked. Like, uh, so you have like normally three places. I think it's Cherbourg and the two others, I don't remember, somewhere in Britain. And again, like we're going to hit the fact that uh, data is never uh, in a good shape. And so here again, we, sh we are supposed to have three things, but there is a big block here, which is we have actually people where we don't know where they came from. So again, we're going to hit missing data in the data set. Uh, good. And uh, uh, another thing I could do, so I can produce like more charts, for instance, like if I look now at the, how much the passenger paid, I could produce a chart which is a bit different, which is a histogram, like the density, so I can get a view of like how much, uh, how much people paid for the ticket, and so you can see, not surprisingly, that most people didn't pay for very much, and like uh, as the price of the ticket goes up, you have less and less people, not a surprise. So the broader point is that I can start uh, using my data and start to produce charts to see a bit like how does this look, uh, what do I have here. So, so far this is not very useful. I mean it's useful because it gives me a sense for what do I have, but uh, what I'm after with machine learning is like I really want typically to do something like do predictions. And so if I want to do predictions, the, the underlying assumption is like if I look at this data, there is probably information I can use which uh, I can leverage to actually give you a prediction which is better than a random choice. So uh, the underlying assumption behind this again is the fact that there is relationship between the data you want to predict and the other data you can observe. So in this case, like, let's look a bit at what type of relationships we have between the data. So for instance, if I was morbidly interested in knowing if people survived or died on the Titanic, what I'm looking for is like out of all the other features or numbers I have, can I use any of these to make uh, predictions about whether the person died or not? So for instance, I'm going to take my sample and I'm going to say, let's explore the idea, perhaps whether you were a man or a woman mattered in whether you survived. That might be a reasonable assumption. So if I do this, I'm going to take my sample, I'm going to group it by sex. So now I have two groups, like male and female, and I'm going to take each of these groups. And for each group, I'm going to compute the average survival rate for each of them. So I'm computing like what's the average percentage of female which survived and what's the average percentage of male which survived. And if I plot this chart, I will see first that uh, I don't know if chivalry is dead, but like it looked like back in the days when the Titanic sank, is like uh, uh, there was a time where chivalry was here. Like you can see here on this chart that uh, if I take the group of females, I see like they had a 72 or 70 plus uh, survival rate. Conversely, if you are a male, it's like you had a, a measly 19 percent survival rate. So the, the short version is like uh, if you were in the Titanic, it was much better to be a woman than a man. And the second part is like this shows me like there is clearly information which I could use if I wanted to predict if somebody died or survived. Like now, uh, one model I could do would be asking the question, are you a male or a female? And essentially here, I'm going to say if you're a female, I'm going to predict that you survived. And if you're a male, I'm going to predict that you died. It's a bit brutal, but uh, this is kind of what the data tells me now. And so this is, uh, this is really essentially what a machine learning model does. So right now, the machine is not really learning. I'm doing the machine learning by hand. And so what I'm after here is something like this. I'm going to create a predictor, which is a function which is going to predict. What I'm trying to predict is what happens to a passenger. And I'm going to simply say, if you're a male, then false, like uh, you die. Uh, otherwise, uh, true, you survive. And now I can use it, take pieces of my data, and produce predictions. It's not a very smart model, but like, uh, uh, it looks simple. But like, this is essentially the simplest possible machine learning model I could build with that data now. And that's, that's really what machine learning does. Uh, good, so now uh, I'm using now one piece of data. The thing I have is like I have much more than this. I have also how much you paid, what your age was, what your class was, all these things. So perhaps I could look at uh, other pieces of information which may be useful. So if I do this, like uh, I could look at things like uh, the class. So I'm going to do the same exercise, looking at first class, second class, and third class. And here again, I will see a bit of a pattern. If you were a first class passenger, you had a 60 plus percent chance of surviving. If you were a second class passenger, 40 percent, and third class, uh, 20 something. So again, like uh, so, this one is not about chivalry, like, uh, and I don't think it changed that much. Is like it was much better to be a rich person on the Titanic than to be a poor guy uh, in third class. And I could build again a model using that piece of information. I would essentially say, if you're in first class, I would predict that you survive. I would be right 60% of the time. If you're second or third class, it's like too bad you die, and I would be right roughly 30% of the time. So this would be another model which is possible. And now the, uh, the problem is like this is a very manual process, and uh, I, I see that I really have like two pieces of information which I could use. The, the, uh, the issue is like, uh, can I use them together? 
And so this is where like, the manual process is going to be a bit annoying, right? Because now we'd have to combine them. How do I do this? How do I put together male, female, first class, second class, third class? What would I start to do if I put like age, fair, and all these things? And so what the machine learning tools will do for you is like uh, they will do what we did by hand, but they will allow you to put more and more and more information in your model. And, and combine it together so that you will get the best possible prediction given the data you give it. That's really what the machine learning, a machine learning algorithm does. Another quick point here is that we looked at two pieces of information which are actually useful. I could look at another one, which is uh, how many people, uh, how many uh, family members you had on board. And here I'm going to see that, yes, I have a bit of a pattern, but like really none of them is uh, significantly above 50%. So this will not really help me much do predictions. So the other point is that this is not magic. Some pieces of information, uh, some, uh, some features or some of the data will actually help you make predictions. Some of it will just not. So you will also have to maybe discard some of it, do that type of stuff. And uh, that's it. So, uh, so I will now go back to slides and uh, make a couple of comments on, uh, on what I did so far. So the highlights of this was like first, uh, the uh, first thing is like if you want to work with data, uh, the way a data scientist or machine learning person uh, will, like it's really important to have an interactive uh, scripting environment, whether that's a REPL, whether that's something like notebooks, because what you will be doing is like you, what you really want is load the data once and you will be asking a lot of questions all the time and you don't want to be spending your time rebuilding, reloading the data, doing all these things. So the first step is like you absolutely need a scripting environment. And as it happens with notebooks and with F-Sharp in general, we have a phenomenal scripting environment here. So that's great. The second point I was making here is that there is no magic in machine learning. Machine learning is going to take a set of data and it's going to look at can I see patterns in that data and can I potentially use it to make predictions. And so we saw first that we had two types of data, categorical data, so which one is it, male or female, and we have numerical data, how much is it, like uh, did I pay more or less than you. And uh, yeah, the th third lesson is, uh, or the last lesson is that data will always be worse than what you expect. And that's uh, uh, recursively true. So like uh, every time you think you have solved it, you will have like more problems with data. Good. So at that point, we looked at the data and essentially what we saw was uh, there is potential in the data to actually produce predictions about who survives, who dies, and all of this. How would we go about uh, doing that? So we're going to search for patterns. and. Uh, uh, essentially what the algorithms will do is like you will pick an algorithm and the algorithm will take the input you have, like all the features, all the input you have, and it will try to fit a function so that the, uh, if you give it the input, uh, the output will be as close as possible to the true answer. And uh, what you hope then is like that what you found in that particular data set will actually be usable beyond uh, what you have in the data you, you used there. Uh, so, uh, elaborating a bit on the point that uh, you have different shapes uh, in your data, uh, you have a bit of a choose your own adventure uh, set of questions to answer when you start doing uh, machine learning. The first one is like, uh, do you have data? And uh, it might be a naive, it might be a silly question, but like uh, I've seen people believing that machine learning is so magical that uh, it will just happen. And the point here is like, if you do not have data, you will not have machine learning. So first step, if you have no data, go back and find me data. And the variant of this is like maybe you don't have enough data, so get more data. Uh, so I'm assuming that we have data, so now is like we're in the yes box. Next step in the adventure is like what is the question you're trying to answer? And there are really two broad cases here. One of them is like uh, I do have a question. For instance, I do want to know like who dies on the Titanic. I do want to know uh, how, many, how much people will pay for my product. Uh, like you have a very specific question. You know the output you're trying to predict. You have a second question which is possible, which is I really don't know. I have data and I would like you to tell me something interesting about it. So uh, which is the box like surprise me and that's also possible. For instance, like you could have your boss coming and say, hey, here is the sales data for last year. Can you tell me something interesting about this? So these are like two different problems you could tackle, and these are two different categories of machine learning problems. And once you are in, if you're in the category, uh, I have a very specific question, uh, you have also uh, an important distinction, which is uh, what is the type of answer you expect from the model? And uh, the first answer would be how much, like how much did you pay? And the second one would be which one, like uh, are you dead or alive? Are you a man or a woman or something like that? So these are also like uh, two important questions. And so the reason I put this as a, as a tree or as, a, as an adventure here is like uh, uh, these all have like uh, names in machine learning. And so it's, uh, it's useful to know what they're called because now you know uh, where to search for them. So the surprise me category where I don't know really what I'm searching for is called unsupervised learning. 
The reason it's unsupervised is like I don't, I can't even tell you what it is I want to learn. I will give you data and I want you to try something by yourself and tell me something interesting. So that's unsupervised learning. The category I do have a question is called supervised learning with two variants. Uh, which one will happen, like what category will happen is called classification. So for instance, uh, did the person uh, die or survive on the Titanic is a classification problem. And uh, by contrast, how much will it be is what, uh, what people call a regression problem. Like how much did you pay for your ticket is a regression problem. That could be a number which could take a, a wide range of values, uh, which is a continuous variable. So uh, with that in mind, now let's look at the second step, which is now I looked at the data, I have an idea that yes, it's uh, reasonable to think that ca I can make predictions. How would I go about that? The way I would go about that is like at that point, I'm not really interested in exploration. I'm interested in producing a model which will make predictions. So I will now move uh, into a VS Code because what I want is to produce code which I can run so that I can actually produce answers. So I'm going to go into VS Code. I'm in the, uh, uh, in the VS Code scripting environment. And uh, so bear with me. So as a, as a reminder, like, uh, I'm going to start with the dumbest possible model I could do. And so what we started with was we observed that if we look at female passengers, 70% of them survive roughly, 72. And if we look at male passengers, like 19% survived. So what I'm going to do now is like, uh, I'm going to use a machine learning algorithm to learn something similar, like using that feature, can I, uh, can I produce, uh, can I predict if somebody survives or not? So I'm going to use here a library which is uh, uh, coming from, uh, so the library is called Accord, which is, probably my, uh, which is probably the library I would recommend to go to if you want to do a start with machine learning on .NET, like has a very complete set of algorithms you can use. And so I'm going to learn now a model called a logistic regression. And so if I want to do this, I will need to take the data and put it in a shape which the algorithm can understand. Like the one thing uh, algorithms uh, understand well is numbers. So I will transform all the input from the CSV file into something which is rows of numbers. So uh, I want to learn from input and output. So first step is like I want to transform my input. So here I'm going to take my sample, which was like passengers from the Titanic. And for each passenger, I'm simply going to extract uh, whether the person was a male. If that person is a male, I'm going to mark it as a one. And otherwise, I'm going to mark it as a zero. So pretty unexciting. But now I get like a big, big list of ones and zeros. Not very complicated. Uh, what I want to learn is the output. So here I'm going to take my passengers again. And for each passenger, I'm going to ask, is, did the person survive or die? So it's going to be a big array of like true or false. And now the next step is I will pick an algorithm, which happens to be here the uh, logistic regression. It's not usually important which one I picked. You could pick other ones. You would get uh, roughly the same structure. So I pick the algorithm, and uh, I'm going to tell it, hey, now I have data for you. Here is the input you can use. Here is the output you can use, learn. So now learn. And out of this, what I'm going to get is now a function or code which I can run, which will give me answers. And so I can, for instance, do something like uh, give me a decision. So here I'm going to say logistic.decide. And uh, if I give you a one, this was encoded a person, like a man. So if I run this, like I would expect the answer to be false. You did not survive, which looks like correct. And uh, just to see uh, if that, uh, what happens if I put a female. Uh, let's see if uh, I would expect this to be true. And sure enough, it's true. So it looks like uh, so far the model is doing something reasonable. Furthermore, I can also ask something like this. Like uh, now, uh, if I give you a man, what uh, probability do you assign to that man to survive? And the answer here would be 19%. And uh, that should be... Uh, uh, familiar because that's exactly what we got from the chart initially. So what we did here is like, and if I do this for a female, let's do this quickly. Let's run this and see, and I'm getting 72%, which should also be familiar because that's what we got from the chart. So what we did here is like we took the very painful, expensive road to do what we did by hand just by looking at the chart. But the point is like this was no magic, and like it did exactly what you would have done by hand, and it just did it automatically by taking the numbers. Now the uh, the the point I was making earlier is like we have much more data than uh, male or female. What we would want is like to put all of this together and use all the information at once to make a prediction. And so this is where like uh, this is where like using a library or like using machine learning would be useful because I don't want to do this by hand. This would be tedious. This would be uh, not fun. Instead of this, what I can do is I can take this and instead of taking just one input, I'm going to start to do things like this. Now I'm going to say like if you take a passenger, I want you to extract that piece of information where you're male or female, one or zero. How much did you pay? 
uh, how many people, how many friends did you have on board, uh, were you first class, second class, third class, did you embark in uh, Cherbourg in uh, this place and in that place. So instead of like one number, one or zero, now I'm getting like a big flat array of numbers which is representing what I think is useful to make predictions uh, uh, about whether you died or not. So this is called like, uh, the numbers where I'm extracting is called like features. So what I'm doing here is like feature extraction. I start with the data set and I want to extract out a vector of numbers, which I think will be useful to make predictions. The output doesn't change. So this is still like, I still want to know whether you died or not. And uh, the process is absolutely identical. Uh, I will pass it into a logistic regression. I will tell it now learn from that input, which is now much bigger under the output. And now I can ask more complex question, like if you were a female and if you paid $150 for your ticket and if you're in second class and embarked this, uh, what uh, would you predict would happen to me? And so in this case, it's going to tell me that uh, I would expect that you survive. And it's telling me also that uh, in that case, I expect you to survive with a 90% chance probability. So that was a woman here. So let's put a man and see like what would happen if I put a man. And now is like uh, what I would get is something like I would expect it to go down because it was not good to be a man on the Titanic, and it went down to 41%. Uh, if I had like uh, somebody who was in, uh, one, two, three, four, in like uh, not in a, a second class, but in first class, I could ask like what happens, how does this compare? So same person, pass it here, and instead of 41%, I see now that it goes up to 47%. So you can, uh, uh, the, the overall point here is like uh, what the algorithm did for me is like uh, cranking uh, together like much more information, but it did the same thing I did by hand before, it just did automatically for me, and it's giving me a much richer answer using much more information than what I had before. But otherwise, like uh, no difference. Uh, yes, so like what we can do here is like essentially we are reducing uh, using the old math trick, like uh, if you have a problem you know how to solve, and a problem you don't know how to solve, reduce it to the problem you know how to solve. So anything you have in machine learning, you will start with the data set, which is whatever you have, you will reduce it to vectors, and once you have vectors, you can use all the algorithms. So that's, uh, that's what, uh, that's what uh, machine learning people do. Uh, one question I will leave aside for a second is like, is our model any good? Like I added features, I added more numbers. My assumption is like it should be better than what I had before. I didn't really check that. Uh, it's not guaranteed. So I will revisit that question in a couple of minutes. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do before is like I mentioned that uh, you have really three broad classes of problems. One of them was classification, the other was regression and unsupervised learning. So I'll show you briefly essentially that this is exactly the same except that you use different algorithms. If I wanted to do a regression on that same data set, I could ask a different question, which is if you give me a passenger, can you predict how much that passenger paid? Uh, and here, the uh, only difference, so we still use uh, the same data set. Uh, I would use input, so in that case, I will not use how much you paid as an input because that's uh, the output I'm trying to predict, but I do the same type of transformation. But now the only difference is that my output will be uh, the fare, how much I paid, and now I will pass it to an algorithm which actually works for uh, regression. That would be like a regression model. I will still learn from the input, the output, and I will still use it pretty much exactly the same way. Like now I can say like for that passenger, I would expect that passenger to pay like $30. And so the broader point is like it's really not different. Like the biggest difference is like the output is a float or a double. Uh, otherwise I transform things into vectors, I put it into learning, and I'm getting a model which gives me prediction. So no big difference uh, on the methodology. I'm going to skip that part. And uh, the other part was about uh, unsupervised learning. So the, one of the techniques in unsupervised would be like, I want to know if there is any pattern in my data. For instance, if I didn't know anything about the Titanic, I would say like, give me, uh, take that data set and can you find me like representative passengers or do you see groups of passengers which are different? So the big difference you will see here is, uh, so this is called clustering. So I'm going to run a clustering algorithm. I'm still going to do the same thing, so you should see a bit of a pattern here. I'm going to take some features like male, female, survived or not, all that stuff. I'm getting again a big fat array of numbers. And now uh, the big difference with before is like now I don't have an output because I don't have a question. So here I don't have an output to pass. I will simply tell it like take that uh, data set and uh, crank it into a model called k-means and try to find me two groups of passengers which are like uh, similar to each other. So I'm going to run this. Now the algorithm again is learning. I'm learning just from input and I have no output because I'm not trying to predict anything. And what I can ask the model is, uh, so now I'm going to, uh, what I want to see is what I got out of the model. And so what I got out of the model is like two prototypical passengers. And so what I get here is like a first passenger type 
And this is nice because that algorithm knows nothing about the Titanic or all these things. And what it's telling me is like I see a first group where like uh, the sex variable is high, so this is probably males. Survival is low. Class is uh, high, so meaning that like, it's two or higher. So it extracted one group here, which is essentially telling me like uh, if I didn't know anything about the data and I looked at two groups, one group you should probably look at is like males, which were like uh, in a second or third class, and these guys probably didn't survive. And uh, conversely, if I ask like uh, about the second group it found, so I'm going to do that right now, and I display this, what I would see is uh, a different group. And so the second group it sees is like, hey, this group is mostly females. These mostly survived. They were mostly in first class. And so the nice thing here is like I didn't tell the algorithm anything, and it found some information which is pretty relevant to the data set. Uh, the method was the same, but like the uh, the type of question you're asking is different. So this is like uh, what you would get from unsupervised learning. So that's in practice, like uh, how uh, the day of a machine learning, like this is what it means to create a model from a machine learning, pers uh, machine learning person perspective. So highlights here is like first, uh, even though uh, .NET is not the, the place, uh, it's not the first uh, place people think of for machine learning algorithms, there is actually plenty of libraries around. Accord is a good one, Alglib is a good one, so you have like plenty of tools around. The second one is like uh, we have like, th uh, we saw like three types of uh, models or three types of questions you can ask, classification, regression, and clustering. And the third point was like even though the problems were widely different, in the end we did pretty much the same thing, which was take a data set, transform it to vectors, give it to an algorithm, let it learn and show me the output. Uh, and every time, so the, uh, on the similar on the process, what we do is like you start with the sample with input or output, maybe no output if you're doing unsupervised, pick the algorithm, extract the features, and yeah, you want to be careful about uh, numerical and categorical data, so that's, uh, that's fine. So, uh, so, so this is what you do when you try to learn from the data. Like the, uh, hopefully this demystifies things a bit first. Like uh, this is not really magical. It's just like take vectors and try to fit a function. Uh, at that point you might say, but uh, this is, uh, this is uh, really not uh, all that fancy. Uh, what you described to me was like find data, uh, if you put more numbers into the vectors, you will probably get better answers. So, and then it's like uh, try every algorithm you have and then ship it. So uh, in that frame, it would look like all you're doing when you do machine learning is put more and more and more inputs. And uh, at some point you get bored or you have no more data to put in and so you move on with your life. And so that would sound like uh, a bit simple and it's not quite as simple. And so the, uh, the first thing we left out so far is that we haven't looked at, uh, we haven't looked at uh, what makes a good and a bad model. Like we just assumed that maybe the model was better, but we haven't done that. And so the, uh, the, the, uh, the way you know a model is good is uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, I think the proverb goes, and uh, the proof of uh, the model is like, if the model is good at making predictions, it is a good model. And so uh, what the machine learning algorithm does is like you give it input, you tell it what the output is, and it's going to try to find the best match. Uh, so now the first thing we need is like we would need uh, some form of metric to be able to compare two models and say, is this better or worse than the, uh, the, uh, the other model we had before? And so the way we would quantify this would be take the input, take the output, compute the error, like look at how far you are, and the further you are from the correct answer, the worse it is, so you can start to compare two models together. And so what the model does is like it's trying to take all the input you gave it and find the best possible fit to the data you gave it. And so now the, uh, the problem here uh, goes back to an earlier slide I had, is that your hope here is like I'm learning something on a training set, which is the data I give you to learn, and my hope is that what I learned on that particular data set will work well in other data I will give you in the future. In the end, I don't care how good you are about predicting data which, uh, where I know already the answer. What I want is to make predictions about things where I do not know the answer. And so, and, uh, so this, is really, uh, uh, this is really one of the problems where people spend time on, and I'm going to show you a bit why. So the way you would validate a model, I'm going to first reset this a bit, and I'm going to go to the part about uh, model quality. going to uh, restart the, so beginning of the script is absolutely the same as before. I'm just going to load my data, do all these things. And so the, the question here is like, uh, is, uh, is it as simple? Uh, the two questions are how would you go about comparing two models? And is it as simple as just adding more and more and more features and just moving on with your life? So uh, one model I could build is like uh, by hand, I could say like, uh, uh, I'm going to predict if you're a male, uh, you uh, die, if you're female, you survive. And uh, one way I could measure whether this is any good is like I really want to check is the answer any correct. So one way I could validate this pretty quickly is say take the model I just created, 
take all the sample for each passenger in the sample, compute what the model predicts, check the correct answer you know, and if it's the same, uh, if it's, uh, yeah, either it's the same or it's not, and like what I want is like as many matching uh, values. So it's gi giving me a big array of true false. This is not quite what I want. Like uh, what I really want is a number which quantifies like how close you are. And so what I really want here is like how many, what's the proportion of incorrect answer I get? So here I'm going to do take all the passengers and whenever the answer of the model is different from the correct answer, I'm going to mark it as a one, this is not correct. Otherwise, I'm going to mark it as a zero, this is correct. And if I take the average of this, what this will give me is like it tells me like uh, uh, on average, your model makes 22% uh, incorrect predictions. So that's now a model uh, which I can use as a benchmark to compare to another model. For instance, I could take a much dumber model, which is like I'm going to predict that everybody dies on the Titanic. So very gloomy. And I could say like, how good is this model? And if I run this one through uh, the exact same metric, it's telling me that this is 38% of the time uh, incorrect. So now I can uh, very precisely quantify like this model is better than the other one. Therefore, I should use it because, uh, because this is good and this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, so, uh, so now we have a way to compare two models together. So now the, uh, the question I'm going to be after is like, uh, what, uh, so what happens if you just add more data to the model? Is this just going to get mechanically better? And so I'm going to simply run something here. So I'm going to uh, predict the output, did you survive or did you die? And here I'm going to uh, start, so you, you can, uh, oh, let me do that, bear with me. And I'm going to take like only two features, like uh, are you a male or are you a female? And uh, are you first class or are you second class or are you neither, which means you're third class. So just going to take two features and I'm going to pass them into a model. I'm going to learn and I'm going to compute quality metrics. So that's fine, input, encode this. So I get like a, uh, encoded my data and I'm going to use the, here a tree. The reason I'm using a tree is like it's a model where it's a great model, but like uh, the problem I want to show happens to uh, show up pretty easily with the type of model. So now again, I'm learning the output from the input and uh, I can ask then is like, how good is this model at predicting things? And that model makes that model is, uh, makes error only 21% of the time, so it is actually slightly better than what you had before. We added one feature. This is great. Now uh, I'm going to do something which is a bit weird, and I'm going to add here uh, noise. So I'm going to add features, and these features are going to be random numbers, uh, either 0 or 1. And uh, reasonably, you would expect that this should not help my model, right? I'm just adding noise to it, so why would this make any difference? So I'm going to... Uh, run this, and like you can probably guess that uh, this will actually make a difference, otherwise I would not make the demo. Uh, so I'm going to encode again, so now it's like I have like 10 columns of like random numbers, and I'm going to again learn my tree, and I'm going to evaluate it, and I had like 21% of errors, and now it's like suddenly by uh, adding like complete random noise, it's like this model dropped to 3% of errors. And so when you see this, it's like, uh, you should see, huh? Like this, this can't be possibly right, right? It's like all I did was adding random numbers. And so the point here, uh, the first point is uh, you should be careful. Uh, it's not because you add more features to your model that your model is going to get better. Or to be more precise, is like the more data you give to uh, the learning algorithm, the more it has to actually fit the data set you gave. And it's going to get better and better and better at modeling the data you gave it. Uh, but it's, uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to work for data it has not seen before. So now it's learning way too much. It's kind of learning details which are completely irrelevant about the data you gave it. So the real proof would be like uh, what I would really want to see is like how is that model performing on data which I didn't use for training. So this is what I'm going to, uh, to use uh, down there. Uh, and, uh, first, like this is a common problem. Like, that problem is called overfitting. And this is one of the reasons uh, why machine learning is not quite as easy as just dumping more features to the model and more data into the model. So here I'm going to do the, the same exact thing. I'm going to add like these 10 uh, fake features. I'm going to take the input. But now I'm going to use the same algorithm, but now instead of using like 13, uh, uh, 1,300 passengers, I'm going to learn on only 1,000 of them, like the 1,000 first ones. And then I'm going to compute the quality metric on two different parts. I'm going to compute the quality metric on the data I used for training, and I'm going to compute it on the data I didn't use for training. And so this should give me now a good estimate for is my model any good? So if I do this, like it's uh, showing me that uh, on the training set, that model 
gives me like uh, roughly 2% error. So I still get like uh, the same spurious result. But now if I run it on the rest of the data, which has not been used for training, my error uh, jumps back up at like close to 40%. So this is a, uh, the method I'm showing here is called cross-validation, and that's at the core of how people validate. The first thing you need is like a metric to know what is a good model and what is a bad model, and a lot of time will be spent at trying your features, putting new features in, see if the model is better on the validation set. So that methodology is called uh, cross-validation, and this serves the same purpose as a, as a test harness for a business application, except that uh, it's just a bit different. Like, you will not get something which tells you it works or it doesn't work. It will tell you it works a bit better, and uh, so that's, uh, th so that's uh, one of the parts. That's why it's not that easy to do machine learning. You just don't do add more numbers to the model. Like uh, you have to pay, uh, lots of things can go terribly wrong, is uh, what I'm trying to say. So let's look at this. Did I have? Yeah. So let me go back to the slides for a second. Uh, so, uh, bigger point here is like uh, the fact that you have good results on your training set means nothing. It really means that like, the algorithm was very good at learning that particular data set. So, uh, if you have results which are too good to be true, they are probably too good to be true. Uh, like the, if your model is really good at predicting, like you should really wonder if you are actually validating right. The second point is like the fact that you have more data is paradoxically not always going to help you. It's like at the same time you have more data to learn stuff, but you also have more noise which your model could pick up as well. So you have to pay attention to that. Therefore, you use something called validation or cross-validation where you're going to split your data in training and validation and you're never really done and you're going to want to iterate, like maybe add a feature, see if it works, see if it works on the validation set, remove it, transform it, do that type of thing. This is where I'm going to move to the uh, last part of the, uh, the talk, which was about uh, data types and pipes. So uh, what I showed you so far is like pretty much every script and every problem I was looking at is really looking exactly the same way. I have data somewhere, it's CSV, it's SQL, it's whatever you want. First thing is I want to read it from somewhere in memory. Then out of this, I want to extract features, which are the numbers I care about. Then I want to pass it to an algorithm and then I want to validate it. That's uh, oh, that was, uh, all the things we did is that. And out of this, uh, the part where you're going to spend the most time is really step two, extract the features. Like this is where you're going to think a lot, like what is it that could be useful at making predictions? The rest is pretty mechanical. And so now the problem I have with the script I had was, uh, it's going to be painful because like, uh, I don't really have a domain visible, like I have an array, I'm going to add things, remove things. Like this is not really a good representation of the domain I'm trying to represent here. And so as a result, I will have a lot of friction in my script. I will not be able to iterate. I'm going to be a bit stuck. Like, so this is not a good place to be. What I would really like to do is something along these lines. What I would like to do is like to say, I'm going to use features, which I don't see in my script so far. A feature takes a passenger and gives me floats. Uh, features could be categorical or numerical. And I want to say this particular model will use these features and I want to use a logistic regression and learn. So, uh, and right now my script is uh, doing that, but it's carefully hidden in a lot of craft, a lot of uh, array manipulation. And so that's not a good place to be. So uh, this is where I find a language like F-sharp is actually helpful because it's statically typed. I can do things like uh, use type for a greater good. So I'm still going to do the same thing in the beginning. I'm still going to load data, that's fine. Yeah, my point here was like uh, that type of thing, like uh, when I start to have big arrays like this, like you can, uh, as a software engineer, you probably see this and like this is uh, ripe for bugs. Uh, like if I start to change this extraction, of, like I can't see anything about what I'm doing here. I don't see that I'm working with uh, where the passenger embarked. I can't see that it's a categorical, that is a numerical value and all this stuff. So how could I use like something like a functional language to uh, make that situation a bit better? I could do this by uh, remarking a couple of things. Like here, what I did was I'm using a map and the first map I'm doing is I'm taking passengers and for each passenger, I'm giving you back an array. Now the second way I could look at this is like I'm redoing a map in a map so the first map is like I'm taking a passenger and extracting numbers and these numbers are an array. So what I want is I want to really pass features and for that passenger, I want to map the features to it so that it gives me a flat array. So the way it would look is something along these lines. What I could say is like now a feature is going to be a function which takes a passenger and gives me back a float. If I do that, then I can say for instance, sex is a feature, that's a function. Fair is a feature, that's a function. Age is a feature that's a function as well. So all these things are functions which take a passenger and give him back a float. And if I do this now, I can clean up things quite nicely because I can say my model is not going to use like this ugly 
uh, array in line, I can say my model is uh, composed of features which are sex, fair, and age. If I look at this in a script, I know exactly what I'm doing. So I can do that. And now I can actually use that map and say, like, you know what I can do with it? I can say, take a passenger, take a collection of features, and encode it by applying with a map all the features I extracted to give me a flat vector. So I do this. And so, for instance, I can do things now like this. Take the input, uh, every passenger, map it by applying the encode, which is a map which applies the features. And if I do this now in one line, I have this whole thing where I'm getting my flat vector. So this is already a pretty nice cleanup because I went from a mess to something where I can clearly see I'm using three features. I can add one, I can remove one, and all the alignment of the data is going to be done for me. So I'm a happy camper already, but because uh, uh, because like F sharp people tend to be a bit obsessive about types, it's like there is still something which is uh, bugging me here. And the thing which is bugging me here is like uh, uh, it's still related to domain is like what I said in the beginning was I really have like numerical features and categorical features. And so that's not visible anywhere uh, in, my, uh, in my model. So I would want to be able to model that. So I'm going to go a bit, uh, so this is the type of problem. Like this is ugly because I don't know if I forgot one. I can't really see if I have like three of them, seven of them. So what I would want is I would want to have a clear visible notion of like uh, categorical numerical. And what will I do because I'm an F-sharp person? I will create a type because like if you have a problem, add a type. And so here I will say really a feature could be two things. It could be continuous or it could be categorical. Continuous will give me a number. And categorical will give me, like, uh, say, three cases on which case is actually active. So now if I do this, I will, uh, skip, I will skip a bit on the details, but I will show you the final result. Like, uh, 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 what I end up with this is something along these lines. Uh, I can write a nice clean DSL where I'm going to say, like, uh, uh, pop, 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 this is here. So still, I can now use my data. I can use my sample. So this is all good. But now, is like using the DSL I wrote, I can write something which looks like that. I can say, I will use a passenger. For a passenger, I'm going to take age, and this is a continuous feature. For embarked, this is a categorical feature, and I have actually three cases. It should match with a C, an S, or a Q. Uh, if it's class, it's something which could be one, two, or three. And if it's sex, it could be male and female. So now, it's like if I look at this, uh, not only do I have a very clear view on what features did I use, I see also like what is supposed to match. I have cases which are like three, uh, three, uh, either a number or like three categories. And now, if I run this, I can also pass it to the logistic. I wrote a couple of adapters. Uh, I also, uh, I also didn't load the dependency I needed, so like this is feeling miserably. So it will ask you to trust me here. But like the uh, the nice thing I got with types is like uh, instead of this uh, ungodly mess of arrays where I pull things from everywhere, I can now state very clearly, this is my model, this is the features I want to use, and this is the type of features I have. So this is going to help me avoid a lot of problems. Uh, I, had, uh, I, had another, uh, I had another piece I wanted to show, but I think I'm running slightly uh, short on time, so I'm not going to be able to do the full demo here. But like the, uh, so the, the, the point here uh, I, I was trying to make is like uh, compared to a dynamic language like R, like Python, like all these things, is like one thing which is nice with F sharp is like first it makes things easy, like loading data was pretty easy. And then I can use types to uh, clarify intent. Like instead of having numbers which are in arrays, I see this is a categorical feature, this is this type of feature. Uh, it will help me prevent mistakes because I have types so the compiler is suddenly playing with me and not against me. I don't have runtime exceptions, like either it builds and I know I'm in a good shape or it doesn't and then it's like I know it's not even uh, worth running it. And uh, it makes just very, uh, because I have types now, I can start to iterate much, much faster on uh, changing my model, modifying them, combining things together. So I think types are awesome. This is not surprising from an F-sharp person, but like, yeah, I love types. Uh, I'm going to skip on the part about pipes. I'm just going to mention uh, briefly like uh, the point I was going to make, but uh, I had the demo, but I'm not going to do the demo. So the, uh, the other question you could ask at that point is like, but, 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 like you are working from a scripting environment, scripts are great. What happens if you have a lot of data? And if you have a lot of data, of course, you might have a problem. Like I'm not going to be able to uh, open petabytes of CSV files on this tiny machine. Uh, I will have only two CPUs. That's not awesome. So what do you do in this case? And what you do in this case is like uh, you, uh, so what you do in this case, first, like you probably don't have big data, like people tend to obsess about big data. I have seen it once in my life on a project. But in the possible case you have big data, using a statically typed functional language is actually uh, pretty nice. Because like most of the work we do is using things like filters and maps. And if you consider an operation like a map and a filter, this is an operation which is uh, trivial to parallelize. 
Uh, the reason for this is that in uh, this type of representation, I have absolutely no shared state. What I did here is that I take a passenger, that passenger can apply a function in code, and I give you back a vector. Passenger and code vector, and each of them are operating completely separately, right? So I can do this in that single machine or in that single core, but I could also split it in two uh, data sets or two cores, and that would work just the same, or 27 and all of this. And so if you have this type of structure using, uh, using a map, filter, and all this stuff. This is the type of stuff which is a bond to be parallelized. And uh, as it happens, is like uh, the parallelism is, uh, so this is where like, I'm not going to show it, I'm going to, uh, but uh, it's very easy to take the type of problems I showed so far. And uh, first, like you could run it on two cores, on four cores, on 16 cores with uh, literally no effort. And with uh, using a library like Embrace, uh, you could also take that and scale it so that I can take it from a scripting environment and ship it on an Azure cluster and run it on like 50 machines if I want. So uh, the good news is that uh, by default, work on a scripting environment locally and this would be great. And if it's not enough, then is like uh, uh, converting it into a way which you can scale it across multiple machines will not be difficult and so you're still in a good shape. Conclusion. First, like what I hope I conveyed was like uh, there is not much magic in machine learning. Like machine learning is way less complicated th than what people make it sound. Uh, the other point is like it is about coding. Uh, and so that's a point which is important to me personally because like uh, machine learning is a really, really fun place to be. And people tend to have this impression that this is for statisticians, this is for mathematicians. The reason it's called machine learning and not statistics is because uh, half of it is about using mathematics and half of it is about running code in production. And so if you take statisticians, they're good at the first part and not necessarily the second one. And so these people need your help. So if you like distributed computing, if you like algorithms and all these things and you don't hate math, I really, really strongly encourage you to look at this because it's packed with really, really fun problems. And uh, it's the right time to look at it too. People are looking for these people. And uh, otherwise, on the F-Shop side, is a uh, People tend to uh, describe F-Sharp as a functional language. It's like uh, one thing which I think is understated is F-Sharp is an absolutely phenomenal scripting language. I hope I give you a bit of sense for this. It's, like, uh, it's an amazing language because most scripting languages are untyped. Uh, this is a statically typed language which has all the flexibility of an uh, untyped language. Where you, uh, so I love F-Sharp as a scripting language. I love it too because uh, it's one of the few languages where I can write code in a script. And then I can take that script and I can pretty much compile it and dump it as a DLL into your running .NET code. And so that's one of the big reasons if, if you have a, a code base which is in .NET in C Sharp, considering a language like F-Sharp is great because like, you can now write your script, do machine learning, and then convert it to code which you can actually run in production, and which is uh, typically a pain point in uh, lots of areas. And otherwise, uh, great at data manipulation, machine learning uh, works very well with uh, functional stuff, and a type system is your friend. So, so this is what I had. So I hope you got something out of the talk. Like, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to ask me questions afterwards. I usually cannot shut up about F-Shop and machine learning, so if you want to talk about these things, uh, I'll be around, and uh, that's what I had. So you can find me on Twitter and all this. Thank you.